Yes guys, welcome back to the Talking Rangers YouTube channel for another really exciting, upbeat video. Hold that thought. Mick Beale has departed Queen's Park Rangers Football Club. <laughs> Let's just pretend for a minute to be surprised. After the spiel four weeks ago, loyalty, integrity, not being the first one to jump the ship after he's got everybody else on board on his project, unsurprisingly, that same man, four weeks later, has departed the football club in the row. But I've been all in Why here and I've asked other people to be all in. So uh, I can't be the first person to run away from the ship. What do we reckon? I think we're much better off without a man that doesn't flirt with a new job every time one becomes available. Now, me and Clive from Loft for Words are going to break this down and give you our thoughts on Mick Beale departing the football club. The notorious Clive from Loft for Words has joined me. Clive, Mick Beale has departed the club. Give me your reaction. Give me the lowdown. Don't hold back. Give it to me. <laughs> oh, dear. Are you surprised? Angry, frustrated, disappointed. But surprise is not the word that kind of fits in that roster. Not surprised at all. Me neither. Me neither. So obviously, I mean, it's the job he wants, clearly. it's He's pretty enraptured with the place and he's obviously tight with the director of football up there. Um, He's basically been flirting with them from the moment he walked through the door, hasn't he? I don't think it was, uh, you know, Mick Beale's very, very savvy and good at manipulating media, social media. You know, he's written books, he's had tactics blogs, he's engaged with fans on social media. So he knows how to cultivate his image um, and work that to his advantage. He's done that all the way through his career. So I didn't think it was an accident on his part that as Gianni Van Bronckhorst, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst was coming under pressure, he turned up, uh, well, not only turned up in the director's box at Rangers for their game against Aberdeen the day after we lost at Birmingham, but also splashed it all over his Instagram stories. I mean, I didn't think that was particularly good from a QPR point of view, because obviously we lost the night before, hadn't played very well. And frankly, I would, I would have preferred him to have spent that day watching one of our future opponents in the championship, all of whom have since beaten us, as it turned out, rather than, you know, so, and I didn't think it was very good from Van Bronckhorst's point of view. I can't imagine him being under pressure, standing there and seeing that going on was too impressed with that. So it's obviously the job he wants and he's been pretty shameless about going for it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not a surprise, is it? No, let's kind of come on to that. You mentioned a, a good couple of points. I think obviously we've seen this this whole scenario play out with Wolves, him turn them down to some degree, whether how close he got to that job, you know, you can read between the lines a little bit that one. For me, what kind of stands out is he's so early in his managerial career, two, 22 games managers managed as a manager um, and at QPR this season. For me, I think it kind of seemed as I think from the offset, this Wolves job, maybe not the right time, too big a step up. And yes, there's been this whole narrative around how Rangers is the dream job X Y Z. I just can't quite get. I know he's a very, I know he's a very savvy man. He's very clever. Uh, he's very wise. But for me, for him to take that jump this early in his managerial career, this early in the season at QPR, when things will be in the last five games, bar those, have been going very, very positively. Why do you think, from his side, there's such a rush? Of this real tenacity to really get to that next stage as a manager when really he hasn't got the experience to back it up. And albeit it is, all bar his ego, it is a big risk at this stage in his career. It's a huge risk, yeah. Um, it, it's going to have to go well at Rangers because it, it doesn't look it doesn't look very good, does it? And the Wolves thing didn't look very good. Um, and, and Wolves wasn't the first job either. Um, I been told by two different people now that he spoke with Stoke about their job in August as well. So I think I think it's a difficult job at QPR. It's a really difficult job. Mm. Um, you know, the team, we've got a, a good start in 11, but it's very reliant on three or four players, um, one of whom, Chris Willock, is quite injury prone and one of them, Stephanie Hansen, is just never fit. Um there's very little FFP headroom to do anything about that at QPR at the moment because they they really went all in with Warburton um, the summer before last. If you think we signed nine players, 
Yeah. No outgoings. Very that was very expensive that and so there's very little FFP headroom to do anything about the problems with the team at QPR. Um in fact it's the opposite. There's there's a there's an FFP headroom issue coming down the track about a year from now that we're basically going to have to to plug a gap of 10 million something like that by selling the players we do have. So that's a, that's a tough gig for a manager knowing that knowing that you not only can you not sign the players you want to sign and you know you and I have been in the room with with Mick Beal when he said that he had some really good players lined up yeah. wanting to come to QPR in the summer and they went elsewhere in the championship and they're doing great and he was I think that was frustrating for him. So if you get the chance to go to a, a bigger club, you know, with a bit more power and whatever, then then that's going to be tempting, isn't it? Um, I think you know it is a it is a difficult job. He is he is ambitious. Um, so I think I think it was a perhaps a degree of frustration there. I think I see my theory when he turned the Wolves job down, which I just couldn't believe. I thought he'd gone because he courted Wolves as much as as much as Wolves courted him. I just couldn't believe that. And the idea also can we please knock on the head now this idea that he rejected Wolves without ever speaking to them? You know, it's been in the, the, the Athletic have said he met with them twice. He impressed with his little presentation that he does. So, you know, that was that was bullshit as well. Um, and I think that's been shown for what it is now with this. And like I say, I don't think Wolves was the first job either. Um, so, yeah, um, it's a difficult job. You take you take the big jobs when they come up, I suppose. Um it's, I mean, it's, it's it's frustrating and it's annoying for us. I thought he, I thought he turned down Wolves for the reason that you've just said. It really doesn't look very good to be walking out on a club this early. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, QPR were doing so well; they were top of the league. I, I thought at the time maybe he's realised that it's a better PR move, a better public image move for him to stay here and get promoted with QPR, which at that stage looked like it was a goer. If the Wolves offer had come in the week of that Blackpool and Rotherham game when we had a sit down with him, or if it came now, I suspect he'd probably go to Wolves. You know, I mm. think, you know, his mood sort of changes with the results like that. Yeah, it kind of almost felt like a penny drop moment. It was kind of like he had this this lucrative offer on the table. QPR was at top of the league beating who was it? Was it Luton at home the night before? No, not Luton. We beat, we beat Card. We absolutely beat Cardiff up. That was we? it. Cardiff, absolutely so. unreal against Cardiff. Yeah, albeit, kind of, albeit with a dodgy with a dodgy refereeing decision, but they. Yeah. Um, and like you say, it kind of this this public image, this thing that he's so concerned with the way he sort of um, almost like you say manipulates the press to create this almost this aura around him, and in kind of taking that that stance of QPR and feeding those lies to us about loyalty and integrity and not jumping ship X, Y, Z really seemed as like he built his stock, not just inside the QPR sphere, but kind of rippled through almost football media in the wider football world and kind of built up this sort of statue almost of this man that had these morals and, you know, um, sort of these morals were a thing of the past in current football era. And then to go to juxtapose that. So, you know, four weeks later, against all this spiel that he, he he spewed out to the press. Just, I just can't fit it together in this image that he's trying to create and how that sort of makes sense. And yeah, maybe he's kind of thinking in the back of his mind, look, football fans are fickle, give it a couple of years, everyone will forget this even happened. Of course, QPR fans won't. But I'm just trying to think where he can kind of go from this. Because even if you look at his social media last week, delete, you know, suspends his profile on Twitter, then he reinstates the one on Instagram and posts a picture of him and H at a concert that he met last week. It was all just very bizarre as to how he seemed so concerned with this public image, but then just to disregard it at the next knockings of, you know, a half half lucrative. I mean, that's a bit, probably a bit disrespect, but the next big offer of a role. It just, I just can't really see where he kind of goes from this because all that praise he got for his integrity has now just gone straight down the drain. It's a bit shameless, isn't it? I mean, it, like you say, it'll all get forgotten if he wins stuff at Rangers, if he does yeah. well in Europe, particularly if he does well in Europe with Rangers. Mm-hmm. Then two or three years down the line, it'll all be forgotten. And um, and yeah, I've, I have actually changed my mind in the end. That was my theory on why he turned Wolves down when he did. I strongly suspect now that he, because like I say, he's obviously tight with the sporting director at Rangers and Van Bronckhorst has been under pressure. I think he turned Wolves down because he knew 
that that Rangers job was coming up. Why yeah. he then, why he then felt the need to give it the big and about integrity and honesty and treat well. I w- I would say treat us all like idiots. I mean, I was amazed anybody bought that at the time, but then I turned up at Birmingham and there was a big bed sheet with his face on it saying loyalty will be reward. I mean. <laughs> That's going to be a collector's item, that isn't it? It's going to make a lovely bedspread for somebody's back bedroom. That is so... <laughs> taking a shit with your trousers on there, lads. Yeah, I wonder if they've still got the they've probably still got the twenty eight days return policy because it was that <laughs> that soon ago. Can we put something else on the? Can you turn it around and put something else on the back? Neil, Neil Christian's <laughs> army army or something on the back. <laughs> I I kind of keep reflecting back to those first sort of interviews he had when he was installed as manager. And I think this whole ambition narrative that he gave and that he wants to be in the Premier League and, you know, these kind of phrases he was throwing around, you kind of thought from that offset that he'd in some essence use QPR as a a stepping stone to kind of get to that next stage of where he think it could go. But I think the way he's almost just used us, and I know coming back to that, of course, he wants to use us as a stepping stone, but in what narrative, in what desperacy does he want to use us as that stepping stone? I think it's been really disappointing. Like you said, you could have come out and gone, look, before this wall sort of thing, you know, reports of, as you mentioned, like, you know, this whole narrative again of him saying, I didn't even talk to Wolves, you know, I was up talking to directors all night. That can, you know, that can go to one side. It just, it is just staggering. And then when you, you piece together, then, you know, that whole spiel again, that he gave us about loyalty X, Y, Z. It, I just can't believe that he didn't want to stick it and just go, look, a season at QPR We'll get him to where I think I can take him. If you're this brilliant manager that you really think you are, and I really think he's he's bought into his own hype massively. He's, I think this ego for him, I think, has really got to his head around this praise, around what he's done with the budget, the players he's brought in, all this. You know, you, you talk to him and, you know, any any phrase of any interview, every single time, again, you know, you're, you're, you're inexperienced as a manager. You haven't got that. Oh, but, you know, oh, I was out in Sao Paulo. I was, oh, I was at uh, the academy at Liverpool. And it's just like, you really think his, his career and so what he's, and, you know, from a managerial perspective, he's an absolute amateur. And you look at time in the job, but I really think his his ego, is he just got him out of control. And I think what he thinks he's doing and what he can do is distant to, to where he is in that timeline. So I think it's just disappointing as to how we knew this whole ambition and stepping stone was coming. But at 22 games into the season, when, you know, things are looking quite strong, to want to jump at each opportunity, I think, is really disappointing. Is there a is there a footballer anywhere in Europe? Do you think that he hasn't known since they were eight years old? I, that's, that's that always get me that one. Uh, on the no. stepping stone, on the stepping stone thing, um, I was in, I was in the crowd on Friday night. There was a few QPR in there for the uh, for the England game. My mate Simo said something that that stuck with me. It's like, yes, we're a stepping stone. That's where we are now for managers and players. But we're also nobody's mugs. No, and that feels like how he's treated us, to be honest. So when you take on Mick Beale, the reason I like the appointment so much is it's exactly the sort of appointment that other clubs make that I get quite envious of. Yeah. Like in modern football, if you've got no money, which we haven't, you've got to come up with clever ways, clever tactics, recruitment, motivation, sports science. You've got a box really clever. And you see the clubs that do that, like Ipswich now with Kieran McKenna, like Graham Potter when he was at Swansea and then Brighton, um, Nathan Jones, I know we hate him, but Nathan Jones at Luton. It's that sort of appointment that clubs are making. Carlos Corberan at Huddersfield, and then they go and overperform. It's like it's coaches and bright people, often without a playing career, really, who've been coaching from a very young age, dedicate themselves to coaching. They're the innovative people, and Mick Beale is one of those. That's why I love the appointment. The problem with that appointment when you make appointments like that is eventually that person's going to want to move on because you are a stepping stone and they're ambitious and that's why you want them. And, you know, Graham Potter's le- left Swansea uh, and Brighton. Nathan Jones has left Luton. Kieran McKenna will leave um, Ipswich. Stephen Schumacher will leave Plymouth, just like Ryan Lowe left Plymouth. So you know that they're going to move on, but all of those managers did at least give the club that gave them their break a season. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we are a stepping stone and that's fine, but we're, we're no mugs either. And I, it does feel a little bit like he's treated us in in that way. Definitely. And I think what's, I think what will be disappointing is those players that have really come in and bought into this um, Michael Bill era. I think mean, where does that leave the likes of Kenneth Powell, who's you know 
really come and stepped out of his out of his fear and come into to English football on the bill. You then got Ethan Laird. I think there's reports today that Manchester United might re, may recall him if they sell Wan-Bissaka in the summer. Players like Park Salter that realistically would never have come to QPR if it wasn't for Mick Bill. There's a lot of these signings that have been kind of players that have bought into Bill's project. Well, let's call it project in inverted commas of you know the timeline he's invested in that project. Where do you think that sort of leaves them now? Because that's got to really be a kick in the teeth. I'm very concerned and very pleased that we've got as many points on the board as we have. Because <laughs> um, like you say, you know, he's... He, he sold this dream to a lot of those players and given it the big chat and all that you versus yourself journey and, you know, all of those glib sound bites that he comes out with. Kenneth Pahl moved here, had other options. His missus still lives back in Holland and he's, I think he's meant to be having his baby during this World Cup break. So that's a big step that he took to come here and, you know, work with a manager who knew him. Um, Jake Clark Salter, like you say, Ethan Laird, Tim Iribunum. Yeah. He's only here because Beale knows him and Beale brought him in. Um, one of his red lines on taking the job in the first place was he was only he would only come on the understanding that Willock, Chair, and Dieng w- were staying for this season at least. I think he he knew they would have to be sold like later down the line, but he said if you're going to sell them this season, then I'm not coming. Hmm. So how do those three players feel now that you know they're still here, stuck here at QPR, <laughs> stuck here at QPR? And, and he's gone. So, I mean, to a degree, it's just football, isn't it? And football players know how it works. If if Chris Willett got a great offer from Newcastle, he'd be gone tomorrow. Like, yeah. you know, as soon as the transfer window opens, that's that's how it works. If you get, you know, Jack Grealish monstered on about what a massive Aston Villa fan he was his whole life. And then as soon as Man City came along, off he went. Same as Calvin Phillips at Leeds. So that's how football is. And footballers get that, I think. So hopefully they'll be, you know, just sort of cynical and the new guy will come in you know and and that we'll hit the ground running and and it'll be fine but I am I am concerned about it for for the reasons that you've just said like people invested in it and you know he's he's bullshitting he's bullshitting them hasn't he basically yeah and I think this is the this is the problem with this this whole you you can't like it's a QPR the club the squad the staff, the fans, it, it's bigger than just one manager. And we can't be put in this constant turmoil every single time a club in the top half or somewhere else around the globe that has a bit more of a stature than QPR is looking for a new manager. Meek Bill's eyes light up and his attention's elsewhere. Going yeah. to visit, you know, going off to Scotland to go watch a game was, as you say, he should really be in the midst of things planning for the next game of QPR. You can't have that constant uncertainty around for a squad. I think that's really dangerous. So we've had it, we've had it after the Wolves thing. We've had it now. Luckily, I think this has come at the World Cup. Couldn't really be in a better time for us to kind of let him go. Just just, just get out. Let's just get out, honestly. I think I've come to the point where it's like, we're better off without you now. Yes, all right. You've shown your capabilities and your potential as a manager, but your head is never really in this project. Let's get somebody that wants to be at this club, wants to develop this squad, because there is some exciting talent in that squad. We've shown premise of what is capable this season. Okay, yes, maybe that's a little bit more uncertain now, but it, it's really time to get someone that and then it comes back to this table of you okay you want someone with ambition again and then you kind of get this cycle of where do we go in terms of next manager i think some of the names you're finding out is um neil critchley is it neil critchley's one of the yeah i mean i mean i'll talk about replacements in, in a minute um i don't mind the manager leaving you know i think of, of qpr's last 22 managers before this 21 of them have been sacked and one resigned so yeah. you know getting managers poached isn't something that's happened since the 1980s and it means that he's doing well and we're doing well so it's actually a good thing but like like I said in my previous answer you know not after 20 games and and three months that's just that's just treating us like mugs I think it's interesting how different people's reactions have been this time I was absolutely gutted when I heard he was going to Wolves absolutely gutted like I was I was on a business trip in France and it was like surrounded by this beautiful like this beautiful scenery and the sea and the sun and everything and was just miserable like oh my god <laughs> why can't we have nice things and this time like everybody else and you can see it on our message board and I think you could tell with Les's comment last week well what's the point if he doesn't want to be here sort of thing hmm. that this time people are fed up and like you say we can't we can't be having this the whole wolves thing when he said he never spoke to them which again it's just the stuff of fairy stories that it's just nonsense but he could have shut that down at the start of the week with wolves he, yeah. if if he genuinely was 
you know, it's all about loyalty and integrity to me. And I feel it's important to stay here at Cuba. He could have said that on Monday that week. He yeah. didn't need to let that drag all the way through that week. Um, but, he could, you know, he couldn't say that because he did want that. He did want that job and he was talking to them and he was interested in it. So, I mean, I mean, this time he obviously wanted this job. QPR offered him the chance right at the start when Van Bronckhorst got sacked to come out publicly or do a video or whatever and reiterate that he wanted to stay here. And he he, he said no. So it's been on the cards like it's been mm-hmm. since then. Um, yeah, I just... Uh, but the difference, like you said, the difference is this time people are people are fed up a bit, aren't they? So, I yeah. I I I've been sitting like I had I had the piece written last week and ready to go, and I've just been waiting to hit send on it because I'm just like you know get get on with it. Then if you if you if you're that desperate to play Ross County four times a year, then just you know get yourself off, mate. Like you're doing me, I didn't know. Yeah, no, like Repl- that- replacement. So you asked like replacements. I mean, well, let's talk. I mean, again. All the problems that we've spoken about, the FFP headroom, the lack of money to do anything with the squad and whatever, that's waiting for that's waiting for whoever takes over and that affects who you can get. I suspect there's some managers in jobs themselves at the minute that they would quite like. Uh, McKenna at Ipswich and yeah. Schumacher at Plymouth being two of those. But, you know, the Ipswich are flying, the chairman's loaded, you know, things are going well for him there. Would you leave Ipswich to come? I don't know. You probably would leave Plymouth, I think. Like Ryan Lowe went from there to Preston, yeah. so that might be a go. But again, you've got to pay somebody compensation, haven't you? Um, so I suspect Critchley will be very, very high on the list because he was in the summer. And I think it was only the size of his payoff at Blackpool that put us off progressing that further. Yeah, And of course, Mick Beale aced his interview with his bloody presentation um so yeah but now Critchley's freely available you know that might be a really convenient fit maybe uh you know he could literally walk in and start tomorrow um you know very very similar vibe has worked with Beal before you know it, it might be a good fit although again you know he walked out on Blackpool to be the assistant manager at Aston Villa so <laughs> don't be expecting a lot of you know if it goes well for Neil Critchley don't be expecting us to be in much different position like well hopefully not 20 games from now but you know <laughs> yeah I think some of the names you've thrown around are pretty on the mark I think as well we it's kind of interesting to see where the almost how long this takes because obviously we had a new you know a um well we're searching for a new manager in the summer that kind of search I'm sure they had a bit of a short list as well the people they interviewed got an idea of because it's quite a vast search led to believe in the summer in terms of that replacement you then had Beal flirting with and I think that behind the scenes as you mentioned the club kind of know Beal his tendency this this ambition so I think they I think it's heard that they started a bit of a search when it came to him leaving yeah, from they've, got, they've got a head start the only one exactly. that was on the list and the, the only one that was on the list in the summer who's now sort of back is in work now and is not available is uh, Rob Edwards yes if this had happened a couple of weeks ago I think we probably I, would have gone quite hot and heavy for him but he's obviously I think got so. the losing yeah. job now yeah, I think, and then you see the standard ones flying around. Your Sean Dyche is in your um, your Wilders, but I don't think they're really. I'd love, mate. I'd love Chris Wilder, but I mean, Sean Dyche was on forty thousand pounds a week at Burnley. I just, I think people need to get their heads around how tight our FFP situation is. Yeah. You know, Sean Dyche is not coming to manage QPR with free transfers and and. Right selling his best he's players and, league gig, isn't and whatever it? we pay in wages. He's just not. I'm really sorry. Like, I just, I hope it's kids that sort of, you know, naively put names like that around because if it's grown ups, I just despair. <laughs> like, it's just not, it's not happening. Like, Chris Wilder's an interesting one. Again, I think when it comes back to those FFP constraints and, and budget, budget constraints, I don't really think it's feasible. So I think it's like, like those, men, those names you mentioned, I think Rob Edwards, I really think would have probably been the number one target, as you mentioned, um, as you say, he's in full time work now. So, so um, Critchley. Neil yeah. Critchley's bar, Neil Critchley's bar me army. I think I think that'll be the one. That, I think he'll be the one that takes the reins personally. But yeah, it's it's going to be interesting now in terms of where that leaves us for the rest of the season. Interesting, as you mentioned, obviously had time at. I think was he at Rangers before with? Was he with? Gerard and Beal. I know he's part of that. Actually, he was he was in the Liverpool Academy with them, and then he oh, went okay. he went from there to Blackpool. Um, was it Liverpool? 
Yeah, so, but, you know, he's worked on a similar budget to ours in the championship. He did well. We blackly brought them up. They played decent football. He kept them up. You know, he they were very reliant on one player who he then had to sell, Josh Bowler, obviously. Um, Who's that? <laughs> yeah, another, another, another one with loyalty. Loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> Integrity the running football, the, constant, the footballer that constantly makes moves to places where he's not going to play any football. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. So, yeah, I mean, I Critchley looks a good fit. I mean, it's early days. What, you know, he'll leave and, and we'll find out who's who's on the shortlist and, the, you know, the bookies' odds will crash through. But Critchley looks like sometimes it's the most obvious thing and if it, you know, it, it looks like a good fit. So, yeah. maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the other interesting thing is, how, you know, whether Beal does go on to fulfil this supposed magnificent potential. I know we don't care, really, and probably hope he crashes and burns, to be honest, at this point. But, you know, like you say, he's very, as we've said a few times in this conversation, he's very good at cultivating this image of Mick Beal, the super coach. Hmm. You know, he didn't reinvent the wheel by switching us to 4-3-3 and have underlapping fullbacks. And in the last sort of four or five games, it's looked <laughs> like the opposition have just gone well... All right, don't let Palm and Laird do that, and uh, and and that's it, really. It's, it's like, oh God, we've stopped them. <laughs> so I'm interested to know whether he goes. I I obviously hope he doesn't now, um, because I'm you know bitter and spiteful and things like that. So, uh, but I'm interested to know whether he whether he is the real deal or whether that's bullshit as well. Mm, it'd be interesting to see what he kind of comes out with. I'm sure there'll be some form of message to to QPR fans. I think it's. Uh... <laughs> he's only got himself to blame really so there's no uh... yeah i think do you know what i think he'll he'll sort of he'll double that he'll go with the this is the only job that i would have done it for it's yeah that's the narrative wonder, that's about. the line he's going to go with yeah. i mean we're obviously recording this before you know it's all all official and whatever but uh the line he'll go with is i wouldn't have done it for any other job um that's what's and, coming. yeah like i say if you if you believe that, or basically anything that Mick Beale says, then do take a friend with you when you go to buy a used car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a nice, what a nice line to run it off with. Any other remarks for? Do you think now the? I think we've none, kind of... none that you could probably put on the YouTube without uh, without them taking. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Let's leave it. At <laughs> that. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> Why do we never? Uh, why do we never talk in happy circumstances, Charlie? I don't know because it's it's not as. Uh... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I knew, I'll have Finney on the phone this week as well. He'd be like, "Can you come on my podcast?" Because that's when I go on the podcast, isn't it? Oh, right, everything. His on new fire. manager or everything's on fire. Get Clive. Yeah. <laughs> Get Clive. <laughs> the extinguisher. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for joining me. Maybe we'll have to chat on nicer terms next time, but who knows if, if many of those will be coming in the distant future with uh, with, with Laird to be leaving in January, a new manager, instability, and all these exciting things you've got to come. But who yeah. knows? It could, it could all turn around and, and be better off. And I think there's potential for it to be, be be better off in the longer term with hopefully a manager that actually fancies staying within the four walls of the club. But we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Thank you very much for joining me, Clive. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I'll catch you when maybe things are a little bit merrier. No worries, mate. Thank you. Cheers.